Christmas and New Year's was just the best. Christmas time, at that time, that was when you drank soft drink or sodas. You could get a whole soft drink for yourself at Christmas time. That that was amazing. <laughs> I mean, it, it seems silly now because you could just go to the store and buy an entire bottle of pop. So soda was not something we drank growing up. So at Christmas time, you got a whole one. And if outside of Christmas, you were to drink soda, one bottle would be shared among three kids, four kids, and it was, it was watered down. And then after Christmas, you had New Year's. You got apples at New Year's Day. So I always made sure I had one dollar to buy an apple, a big red apple. Right now, apples are everywhere in the supermarket all year long. So there is, it's not a novelty anymore. But New Year's Day, you bought an apple. That was great. I'm very excited to welcome today Sharon Pierre-Louis. Sharon is a St. Lucian woman who was raised by a single mother. She grew up very early learning about hard work and over the course of her life, she experienced a lot of loss that she had to learn from. And even with that, she also learned how to take risks. I'm excited for her to share her story with you today. And I hope that you take away what she calls her journey with gratitude. I am Sharon Pierre-Louis. I am originally from Castries, St. Lucia in the Caribbean. I was born in the central part of the city, which is called Rose Hill. I was born there and then um, I can't remember exactly how old I was when we moved, but we moved further up north, um, north of Castries to Cedars. Growing up in that area, it was, it was more of a community. It was the older ones taking care of the younger ones, the, the older kids of the neighbors. They took care of us because the, the, the parents were out working. And so the older kids took care of the younger ones. And um, that's where my memory started. What do you think is your earliest memory? Hurricane Allen. I think it was 1980. All I could remember, my, it was just my mom and I. My siblings were not with us yet. It was just my mom and I. And I didn't know anything was going on. So my mom and I shared the bed. And what I remember was waking up. I saw my mom in the window looking out. And I heard my neighbor, Miss Jules, shouting at my mother um, in Creole, are you okay? And I, my mother responded that we we're getting water. So apparently the roof had lifted a bit. So she would say, she was telling her we are getting wet. So in Creole, she said, Mweka muye. so I'm getting wet. So my mother wrapped me up and we left the house and went across to the neighbor. It wasn't that much of a distance, but you know. Um, and I remember the older ones grabbing me and said, come sleep with us, Shasha. That's how they called me. So I, it was like a, a sleepover. It was exciting. But I had no awareness of the dangers of a hurricane. Years later, with all the the recall and all the talk about it, that's when I realized how terrible Hurricane Allen was at that time. The next morning, um, we were all, as kids, we were helping with the cleanup, the breadfruit trees, all the breadfruits were down, the avocado trees, you know, all of that, the mango trees, the branches were broken, but we were just cleaning as children, we were just cleaning. There was nothing frightening about it. And, and, and that's the thing about being a child. You, you don't have that awareness of danger, you know? And so that's my earliest memory, if I recall. Yeah, that's it, Hurricane Allen. I had a condition, um, well, it may not be the technical term for it, but um, topical eczema. So if a mosquito bit me, 
it instantly turned into a sore. And also, um, it, it would like the whole lower part of my body, my legs and my feet. So there was a point where I couldn't wear shoes or flip flops. And so um, at a very young age, I used to walk from my home in Cedars, which is the top of Cedars, to the end where, where Sun built, um, which is another community, um, ends. And I had to walk from there as a little child, a little six, seven year old, walk from there to the Castries Health Center. I think in North America, it's called urgent care or walk-in clinics, as um, it may be known. And I would sit there on the bench and I would go get my sores looked after by myself. I was very independent because my, my mom was a single mom. I remember um, being very upset that I had to go to the health center um, on a Saturday morning because that's when the favorite shows would be on, like BJ and the Bear, Knight Rider, you know, um, Dukes of Hazard. Those shows were, oh, and the most important one, wrestling. I had to go to the health center at a certain time, but it had to be done. And by that time, the sun was already high in the sky and the, the road was very hot. So I had to walk with one flip-flop because the other one, the other foot was so badly covered with sores that I couldn't stand a flip-flop on it. So I had to walk. <laughs> it, it was, it was um, a very bittersweet time of my life growing up um, around that time because everything would irritate my skin. Everything. You know, sunflies would something would bite me, it would turn into a sore. If I fell, it would turn into a sore. Everything irritated my skin. The most relief I got was when we went to the beach and I would just soak in the salt water. And you would think that the salt water would, would irritate, would burn the open sores. But no, I felt really good in the salt water. And then... Um, by that time, I was, I think I was about 14. Out of the blue, it just stopped. And everything just healed and never came back. And what was your mom like? My mom was very hardworking, but she was also a disciplinarian. So I knew what borders not to cross. So I was never a kid that got into trouble for doing things that were wrong. I may have gone into trouble for my mouth because I was very quick with the responses. But <laughs> even as a child, I mean, I've learned how to temper it as I've gotten older. My mother, on the other hand, was very stern. And looking back now, I realized because she had a lot to deal with. She had to bring food to the table. She had to make the money. My mom lived in a, a very small one bedroom house or she rented. Um, and I think it didn't feel small because we were never inside until it was time to sleep. You were always outside running the neighborhood, then going down the road and running up and down and just playing. So the house never seemed small until it was time to sleep and you still didn't recognize that it was small. I never thought of us being deprived or poor, the poorest of the poor. I was, and if it goes by having material things, then yes, we were poor, but there was never a day I was hungry ever. I had clothes, um, my grandmother lived in the UK, so sometimes she would send me some stuff because at the time I was her only granddaughter. I, I had books, and it's because I went to the library. It was there for free, so I just never felt poor. You said you were raised by a single mom. What was the household like? Paint us a picture into your life there. Well, my mom had other kids, but um, I think at the time... Um, I, I, I never really ask her because those are questions you don't ask at the time. Yeah. Um, you don't, you don't ask like, where, why did you only have me here? And the, my other siblings were not there. 
my other siblings were living with family. So my two older, older siblings were in Fort Saint Jacques, which is on the west coast, <laughs> west coast of Soufre. And um, my brother before me, he lived in with family again in Chozel, which is another community after Soufre. And they live. It was just my mom and I for a very long time. And um, my brother, and then my mom had my my last sister, her last child. And it was then that my my older sister was brought up from Fonce Jacques to live with us, to help with taking care of my younger sister. And my brother, he eventually came up to live with us um, because he had succeeded the common entrance. And so he went to Leon Hess. So he came to live with us then. So by then my mom had pretty much all her children. My eldest brother by that time was old enough to live on his own. It was it was kind of weird because the dynamic, it was just me for a long time. And then all of a sudden we have all these other people. So um, I think I may have acted out a bit in hindsight, I may have acted out a, a bit because now the attention wasn't on me alone. Um, but still, um, it was nice to share the load in terms of doing household chores. <laughs> How many uh, siblings do you have? Oh, well, being from the Caribbean. <laughs> in total, my mom has five kids. And... My dad has five kids and I share one sibling. So I have one full sibling. In my mom's kids, I am number four out of five. In my dad's kids, I know this is going to be confusing for a lot of people, but except, except for Caribbean people, sorry. <laughs> we understand, yes. In my dad's kids, I am number two. I'm his first daughter. Um, my, so my brother and I, we, we, we are four, same mom, same dad. Um, so he was the first, I'm the second. And then my dad had two other sons after me. And then, um, my youngest sister with his wife. So he had a second daughter 11 years later. Um, my mom had my last sister. So she's, there's an eight year difference between she and I. Again, you know, in hindsight, you wonder why weren't the relationships encouraged? Why weren't the kids brought together? And the folks back then, they just didn't answer questions. They didn't want to, oh, leave that alone. Um, that's not your business. Or in Creole, they would say, Sapazafo. You know, so I just learned to just leave it alone and just accept what is in front of me at the moment. That is something that has created a lot of issues in family. For instance, again, this is going to shock a lot of people, but my, my paternal grandfather, apparently he had 40 kids, four, zero. And they're only now getting to know each other. And some of them are in their 60s, 50s, 60s. Apparently, I have an aunt who's younger than me, who's younger than my father's last child. Because my, my grandmother, um, she said when she came to St. Lucia one year, my stepmom and my little sister went to visit my grandfather because he was ill at the time. And he did have a young lady there with him who was expecting <laughs> so, so I I have an aunt or uncle who is younger than me and my father's last child. So <laughs> she she did something that I am extremely proud of. She built her home with cash. With cash, she saved up for many years, um, and she built her home. Entire, let's see, one, two, three, four bedroom house, kitchen, and a small living room, bathroom with cash, all cash. My mother 
had a canteen, but prior to that, my mother, um, she, she had a basket, a big straw basket, and she would make things like saltfish, smoked herring, you know, and then, um, have hot dogs. And she, she had a bag with about six, um, gallons of juice, fresh juice. And she would go from business place to business place and sell that. And that's how she started until she would go on construction sites. And that's what she did until, um, this new business opened up. Um, it's called Caribbean metals. They do roofing, etc. And the gentleman there, I think he had met her somewhere and told her, well, we opening up, there's a canteen, you can occupy it. And that's, that's where she ended up. And that was good because it meant that she, a lot of the things that we had to do to help her um, could be done at the canteen now. So everything was prepared fresh at home. So from a very young age, let me backtrack. Every Saturday, my mother made cake, um, coconut cake, and she would sell it um, down by the Castries Market every Saturday. And as a child, I remember waking up on a Saturday morning and my mother is sitting there on the chair mixing that butter, right? And my sister and I had to take that butter in the cake pans and bring it down to this bakery in the central of the city. Um, it's called Ama Bakery. It's a well-known bakery. Everybody knows Ama Bakery. So we had to bring, carry these boxes on our head from Cedars all the way down to, to Ama Bakery. So they can, I don't know if she rented something in there. I was having this conversation with my sister, like, what happened? How did, you know? Anyway, so that's what I had to do. And that thing was heavy. I was this big, probably 60 pounds soaking wet. And I had to help my sister. We had to carry this thing on our head and go down to Alma Bakery. And my mother would be home preparing herself and then go down to Castro. So I never saw my mother. By the time we walked back home, my mother was already gone. And so, so she would do that thing and during the week on a Saturday, she would do the cake, sell the cake. And that's how she started saving money. And another way she made money every carnival season, carnival season, I was tired because my mother's, my mother had this tray and she sold, um, barbecue chicken. She sold, um, fish cakes. Um, she sold floats and um, bear and soft drinks and, you know, little lollipops, little things like that for the kids, if they, you know, while they wait for their parents. And my mother became known for the good barbecue and the good floats and acra. So sometimes I would have to help her. And whilst I'm there helping my mother, somebody would buy $10 worth of floats that's not even in the pot yet. <laughs> And that was what it was like. So she would have these big five-gallon um, buckets of butter for Acre. And that's a, that's a big bucket. And all of it would be gone because persons would be coming looking for Miss Julia. And it would be sold out. And the barbecue chicken, she's having, she would buy about four cases of barbecue chicken for Carnival Monday, let's just say, and that would not be enough. That's a lot of chicken, you know? And at a young age, because I was in my early teens, like 12, 13, and I was already seasoning chicken to help out. And that's how she made her money. She made her money like that. And the canteen was Monday to Friday. And sometimes if there was work around, she would come in on Saturday to do it as well. You know, and that's how she sustained herself. You know, so it was a lot of hard work. And we had to be right there with her. Um, 
mornings by that time we have we had moved to Corinth in the house so we had more space to you know prepare stuff everything was made fresh everything was made fresh so it was some tough times it was um, early mornings she would be up at four and she would wake us up at five and she had to be out the house by seven so that was that was our daily thing and in the evening season up the meat season up the chicken prepare all the all the condiments and everything it, it was it was hard work it was hard work but um our life was a little different when we moved to Corinth. I was still in secondary school at that time. Um, and then my mother was still working hard because if, if the TV crashed, my mother was not paying anything on higher purchase. She would, she would go the initial higher purchase, buy the television. And, and I think the deal was if you paid within three months, you pay the, 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 the retail price with no interest. This lady, within a month and a half, it was already paid off. That's how she went about doing things. Um, so she was always working hard, working hard to make the money and, and provide for the household. And to some extent, I don't think I really appreciated that because as a teenager, you want all the things your friends have. And I couldn't get the latest Reebok or LA Gay or um, British Knights, you know, those nice sneakers that were the thing back then, or the nice clothes. I didn't have that luxury because um, everything she was doing was to make sure we had a roof over our head, the bills were paid, and we had food. And so what I translated into was when I started working, I started helping her out with my youngest sister because she was still in high school at that time. And I started helping my dad with my youngest sister because at that time he had stopped working. Is there any fun memory that comes to mind of you and your mom together growing up? Every year at Ave Maria Girls Primary School, there was always a fair. And I don't know why, but somehow my mother, I was always chosen to bring a cake for that fair to sell. And that cake used to be the one that was to go there first. So I used to be so proud that my mother's cake would sell out first. And you see all the other cakes in a whole day. They sell. But my mother's cake is gone. <laughs> so that, that was a good thing. Um, another memory, my mother, like when we moved to the new house, again, we had more space. And my, my youngest sister was getting older at that time. Every Sunday, my mother would allow us to try things. So... Um, like to try baking stuff, just little concoctions. Um, I remember when I did home economics at my secondary school, Castries Comprehensive Secondary School, I, the teacher, she would not allow us to taste the stuff because when we made the stuff, it was sold at break time to replenish the supplies. So sometimes you would take the corner of the thing and just to taste it. So my mother would allow me to try those things out on the weekend. Um, and that was great. And she did the same thing when my little sister herself was doing home economics at Leon Hess Secondary School. And, and also, um, we used to try different types of pizza. She would buy that pizza dough that they used to sell. And we would just buy toppings. We'd tell her what we want, she would buy one day, my younger sister and I, we oh my God, that is so gross. Um, we tried pizza with mixed vegetables, like from the can, raisins, and cheese. Oh, that was so disgusting. That was so disgusting. Oh my Lord. But it was a waste. But my mother, and, and my mother needed that money, but she allowed us to try it. My sister and I, we didn't eat it, but the boys ate it. They didn't care. You know, boys, teenage boys, we eat everything. They ate it. So it didn't go to waste per se. But that was the most disgusting thing we made. <laughs> and, and my mother had a spirit of sharing. Um, my mother was always sharing. Always sharing. You know, always giving somebody stuff. And I picked that up. 
So even in my workplace, I was always making stuff and sharing with my colleagues. And my sister does the same thing. That essentially was my mother. She would get home, everything was done. Say she's sitting down to watch the news. She had a crush on Peter Jennings. Oh, interesting. My mother had a crush on Peter Jennings and Tom Selleck. So she didn't watch many TV programs or whatever, but we all had to watch the news every night. And um, she wanted to know when Magnum PI came on because she had a crush on Tom Selleck. <laughs> and you know, sometimes you know how you, you pick up on certain habits of your parents. I think I kind of like the mustache and beard as well. 